Dear Denizen, it's Lonnie Pacinger. I'm still working behind the scenes to get Kirby released from the Dream Police. They refuse to clarify the charges against him. All they say is he is a menace to digital society. I've been able to decode another hidden, compressed track of video spatial data from the tablet. So I'm going to fill in some visual action as I see it. It's an experiment. And with that, let's start the show. You're not going to believe who I glimpsed in the Waitrix. But first, one more thing about cyborgs. I gave you the three degrees of cyborgization, yet they occur only in Laos. What about Body Cambodia, Vnet Ram, Neo Amsterdamia, for God's sake? By Laos, I mean the acronym limbs, appendages, organs, and sensory systems. Tick three boxes in any of those four categories, and you are a cyborg. But Thornton, you say, what about super secret cyborgs? They may be just a wisp of central nervous system flesh or even a ghost of pure consciousness in a digi brain downloaded into a fully cybernetic body. Are they cyborgs too? Yes. What if their setup is entirely wetware? Still a cyborg. Look, let me tell you a story. Dilbo Blackens. Who was he? More commonly known as Cybo Blaggins, and not to be confused with adult hollow film star Dildo Braggins, Dilbo was a furry-footed cyborg short of stature but long in the heart department. Not a genetically distended heart. More like the ethereal personal commitment to one's ideals. That type of heart. Dilbo had cybernetically enhanced thumbs and big toes due to a freak corn-eating accident. Nonetheless, he journeyed on a quest to save the world from Soren, the evil cybersecurity firm. Soren was circling above and spying on people's business like a nosy eagle. Why don't you fast forward to the part where you proclaim, and I... Much like Mr. Braggins, I am the righteous one. Wow, I feel seen right through my jumpsuit. I do specialize in echolocating low-hanging fruit. Fine, well, let's zip forward to the point where Dilbo went full cybo after getting crisply fried by a drone's plasma cannons. Queen of the Dark Elves uploaded his consciousness to the storm cloud, then downloaded him back into the body of a recently deceased and footless dark elf. Onto this body, Dilbo's furry feet and calves were grafted. He then became the first elf droid. Dark elves were deeply discriminated against due to the pigmentation of their skin, a common phenomenon on dearth in the last century or so that has evolved to be less overt but still present in many ways. Much like any convenient form of persecution, whatever keeps the megacorp workers pitted against each other and not their corpo overlords is good for management. So what's the point? Umberto materialized into one of the hanging VR skin suits in the red surveillance room. Why would you subject us to such a distorted and narrow interpretation of a myth about the efforts of a whole cadre of hell hackers, bandits, and spies? Um Umberto? I... Dilbo was merely one cog in the machine, yet you deny the network supporting him. Is it for the same reason that you left me for dead, my dear brother? How are you here? Sorry, my long-lost brother-in-law just appeared in a VR suit in front of me, and I can't tell if I'm hallucinating or he's some kind of phantasm. Don't change the subject. You did imply that I had a hand in your death while I was in the middle of a story about the hoblet... Cybo Blaggins and his crew. I was just getting to that part. You were glossing it over. 
Like you glossed over me. When your relationship with my sister began to falter, you lost interest in me. You stopped texting me good wishes on my birthday. I was demoted from industrial engineer to courier in the same organization where you were rising. I thought you didn't want help because nepotism. Well, I'm back. Let's just say they took care of me in their own way. I'm so glad you're here, brother. I've been so lonely. Dilbo Blaggins was a coward. Right. That's important. And he had a whole crew of hell hackers and operatives who took the fight to Soren. He didn't want to be reborn as a dark elf or anyone else. Unlike a trillionaire android who sees eternal life in newly replicated bodies, he forced himself to transform and be reborn into the role his rebel forces needed him to fulfill. Cybo Blaggins symbolizes that we do not exist independently of each other. We are connected and we know when we must do what is right. Not doing so is its own punishment. I must go. Is that it? We shall have to see, won't we? Your fly is down. Oh. He's gone. Umberto? Come back. I I messed up. I... I didn't realize how much I needed to talk to somebody. No offense, Blompy. You really should pick up whoever's listening. Just say something. That brings us to my fateful sighting yesterday. Remember how I saw someone mosey across the monitor in the fallout shelter barracks? They were wearing a full snuggy blanket getup. Well, I saw her again. It's none other than Haroka Soyerton, my former colleague at Satoyo Seer Worldwide Megacorp. Haruka was a systems surgeon, a staff ripper doc for employees, and a resident researcher in the cybernetics lab. She was also the second great love of my life, or at least she would have been if she hadn't gotten away or been taken. A heavy footstep fell behind Thornton, and before he knew it, the cold snake-like fingers of some otherworldly demon tightened around his neck. Stop! Unhand me! Untentacle me! Please! That's nice. I thought you wanted someone to talk to. I'm here. You've summoned me with your chasm of hopelessness. The Night One swished around in front of Thornton, revealing the form behind its voice. It looked like a tall, 400-pound man in a panda mascot costume. Its forearms rippled with unnatural movement, and its huge, jet-black hands stuck out of the black, furry panda suit, snake-like, instead of digits. The thumb and three fingers consisted of malleable, undulating tentacles. They extended several feet with no discernible limit as they constricted his airway. Then, their grip slackened for a moment. (coughs) (coughs) What are you? Can't you tell? Oh boy. No, I I don't know of creatures with animatronic panda heads and leviathan thingies. Thingies? Do you think this is a joke, geezer? No, 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 not again. My name begins with the same letter as the Nightingales. Nigel? No, you pathetic dreamer. That suits me. You're, you're not the night one. Bingo, bango, nailed it. Then, with a twitch of riven flesh, as if naming it severed the Night One from its hands, it vanished. Its hands remained, 
They clung to Thornton's neck loosely, then sloughed off and dissolved, leaving black smoke and ash on the floor. <laughs> Blompy, I'm scared. Did you see that? We need to ward off this evil being. Buddy? Ah. Clampy materialized with a slow, bleeping whir. Wazzle, please. Deposit it in my clamp today to keep the whim-whams away. Well, look who decided to drop in. Clampy's still stuck in a glitch loop with his palm outstretched waiting for a wazzle, and Wompy is just about shaking off the heavy chain mail of sleep. I told you, I ain't got no wazzles but and no butts either. Then who has the whole stash? Or must I venture all the way back to the waiting room? Cyber bomb, Mike. Cyber whom? Bill. Cy Bell. Not Cyber. Guy we used to call Cyber bomb. Vlather from above opened a ceiling hatch to establish a clear channel of communication. Who said that? Cyber bomb. Vlather burst through the ceiling and fell on the floor. <laughs> You say it again, I'll point this, and I will extinct you, Ratwings. Uh, excuse me? I met your buddy. Name's Wrath of Murglebound. Pardon my interruption, you look nervous. Holy hypertext transfer protocol. The Vlather? So did you get out? I have so many questions. And your journal. You took my bolo jacket too, you goddess. What? Thief, dimwit. Please, take the jacket with you. You're not at all like I imagined from your writings. Oh yeah? Well, I wasn't cybernetically upgraded when I scribbled all that mission gas. And don't you ever call me Cyberbaum again, both of yous. You probably crapped in my pocket, so keep the coat. Are you insinuating I'd take a schlitz in your pocket? Anyone's pocket? No, I was talking to your very little powder fluff pal there with the vainly gross wings. Come again, you Frankenstein, board brain, scalawag covered in potato chip dust and dead. Who knew this illiterate stool bass knew how to sign his own death warrant? Prepare to walk for the rest of your life, big addict. That's enough. Stop baiting cyber bum. I heard that. I, or, I mean, look, Mr. Murglebaum, is it? Can you spare me a wazzle? And go all the way back to my stash spot? How am I supposed to get up there? Up into the ceiling? <laughs> nice try. I'm not telling you where it is, Numbolt. Just relaying that your actions have consequences. You mean consequences? Yeah, like I said, egg-headed point, Dexter. Give me a hand. Uh, okay. How, how's this? You, you need like a step? I'll, I'll just fold my hands together here. Does, does that help? Oh, oh. Vlather's leg jets shot him up into the air. Oh, wow. Ouch! Hot diggity! He grabbed onto the lip of the hidey hole in the ceiling duct from whence he had emerged <laughs> and hoisted himself back inside with the grace of an unsynchronized swimmer. As Thornton nursed his singed hands, Vlather poked out his head and chucked a few wazzles at him and Blompy. What, you never see a cyborg with jetpack dams? Here's a few wazzles for your troubles. Later, Crocodile. It's actually... forget it. Flather closed the hatch with a thud. Hey, wait, you forgot about your journal and jacket. He's gone anyway, and you asked for it. Now, if you can stop squirming like a worm on a hot brick, sprinkle some of that sandman dust on us. Guess I can always give Clampy his wazzle after we venture to the downside up. So, off we go. I got a little bit ahead of myself touching upon the tale of the stone stew last time, so I'm going to walk it back a bit. We return to Lilike's story, which was fast becoming a narrative out of their hands. It's a common phenomenon for prodigies lacking the social acumen and strategery of crafty adults. Speaking of whom, when we left documentarian Constance in her hotel room on the 70th floor of the Pennsylvania Mega Hotel, she'd been through a lot. Hitman turned burglar Clarence Riggs 
had broken into her place and robbed her of the footage from her recent interview with Lily Gay. But Ben, her audio engineer, had showed up to check on her before Riggs was able to bounce. Ben's other motive was to see if he could borrow a dry towel and the belt of her terry cloth bathrobe. This was the vibe. At least there's no moaning. No oh, great person in the room across from me is poking their head out the door. That's not good. Tie it up, put a bow on it, I gotta go. You should go back there and maybe close the door before the sex scene starts. Roger that. However, the vibe changed when Ben finagled his way inside to do a welfare check. Hitman turned burglar Clarence Riggs watched along through slats in the door to the closet. Unfortunately for him, he had snuck into the very place where Constance's bathrobe hung. He could practically feel its belt tickling his calves. Ben entered the hotel room and paced the carpet while sheepishly tightening his beltless bathrobe around him with a hand in each pocket. Constance locked the deadbolt and turned to face him. Their eyes met like those of a predator and its prey. She shot him a withering look as if to say, You satisfied? Now go. Ben wheeled around to open the first of two sets of closet doors. Aha! Pulling the handles with his hands still in the pockets of his beltless robe. The closet doors rattled and resisted opening. Ah. He hugged the door so as not to expose himself to Constance. He practically fornicated with it in an attempt to pull it open, but it wouldn't budge. In an instant, he had rendered himself into a fool who juts his hips into bifold doors in flurries of desperate passion. Mm-hmm. How do you open this? Benjamin, if you can't open it, maybe you shouldn't. Constance strolled over to the other set of doors and opened it with ease by pushing it in, which made it accordion to the side. Scooch over, CC, Hemingway's ghost cut in. Clarence CC Riggs shuffled over to the other door Ben was pulling on just in time, propping his foot on it. Ben tried to imitate Constance to no avail. He rattled the closet door. Oh. Come on. Huh? There's nothing there, Ben. Looks like you're humping up the wrong tree. It's unattractive and needy. It's called chivalry. Anyway... I'm not giving you my belt. Who needs a belt? Oh, give him the belt, said Hemingway impatiently. Riggs bit his tongue in a struggle to keep his thoughts contained as his mind spiraled out of control, strategizing. I'd rather not have to terminate this schmo. But if I don't exit fast, the whole point of doing this job to finance my medical salvation will be moot. If I get caught... Doubt they'll allow me to see a black market ripper dock in Ascension, or anywhere. And that's assuming I survive. Any Damien with half a cyber brain would bet against my odds of walking out of here. So I'm going to need leverage. Not, Not to, to interrupt, interrupt your, your bullet train of worries, but hearing you think is great. You're eavesdropping on my thoughts? You depraved phantom. You see... We have a visitor approaching, and it's not going to go smoothly from here on out. It's time to man up. Someone knocked firmly on the front door. Hotel security. See? See what I mean? You remember what it means to be a man? Or has the cancer eroded away that part of you too? I don't think this is the time or place to delve into my manhood. You of all people don't even have a... Ow! What are you doing? Feel that? It's called chest pains. That's uncalled for. And Petty, why, why would you hurt me? Look, there's not much I can do here. But I'm trying to keep both of us alive. And I'm trying to preserve your chances with Miss Peterson. Ma'am? We have a uh, reported pervert in the hall. Are you safe? Sh should I go in the closet? No. Got it. No fear, ma'am. Please open up so we can assist you. The guard knocked harder. Hold on. I, I was talking to someone else. Unregistered guests are not permitted. 
I'm afraid we have to enter the room, unlock the door, or we remove it from its hinges. CC piped in, scuttling his commitment to stealth mode and revealing his hiding place. Open it, Connie. Connie? Who said that? Before Constance could retort, Riggs started raw-dogging his innermost thoughts out loud. And, and it's weird. It's weird you want me to call you Papa. I don't like it. How foolish of me. Of course she yearns to be the daddy. Yes, Ben. You've finally figured me out. And you are out of your depth psychosexually. Are you mellow for this jello? Wooden for this pudding? Um... Nope. Rhetorical question. Just... Just get in the closet. With your gravelly-voiced ghost bottom? No thanks. This guy knows more than he thinks, said Hemingway's ghost. It's... It's complicated, Ben. And yet, how am I being singled out in a room full of extreme sexual deviance? I tip my hat to you, Constance, for you are the most debauched mix I've ever encountered. Ben relented and stepped into the closet to avoid the encounter with hotel security. Riggs gripped his upper arm with a firm hand and whispered, Don't do a damn thing unless I say so. Got it? Okay, everyone's the daddy. I get it. Constance unlocked the front door. C.C. Riggs powered up his cyber blowgun with one arm and banked on the element of surprise as he stormed out of the closet with Ben in tow, barely keeping his robe together. C.C. ordered everyone into the bathroom. Constance, the off-duty blackguard working as security, and Ben. In short, what was supposed to be a routine burglary turned into a high-stakes hostage situation. It hit the news feeds in a matter of minutes, as the blackguard pinged his station commander using a secret communicator and hover cars surrounded the hotel. Sirens and a supersonic megaphone blared. We have Yens surrounded. Come out with his hands up and all cybernetic weapons disengaged. In the Pessoa household, all was not swell. Hernan had panicked after not being able to find Lelike and reported them missing using back channels to the governing authority group and others. For their part, Lelike watched it unfold on the holographic news feed as they hid on the rooftop. Lily felt sick to their stomach. It was only yesterday they were texting back and forth with Constance and something about the brutality of the broadcast's description of hostages being held at the end of a deadly high-tech weapon by a berserk killer, possibly suffering digi-brain rot, filled Lilike with despair. It wasn't merely due to the suffering of Constance and the others whose lives hung in the balance. It extended to thoughts of their father Hernan's guilt. If Hernan had played a role in concocting the poisonous stew, which felled no killed Victor Von Drum, he would no doubt benefit from Constance meeting a gruesome end. Hernan grabbed Lilike's hollow phone and shut it off. The wind of the rooftop enveloped them in a howl. You crazy kid. We've been looking all over for you. You're not to watch that. I think I'm old enough. And where did you get this hollow phone, eh? It was a gift. We'll see about that. Father and child returned to the apartment where the news feed continued to play in the living room. Mom? She's busy. Go to the safe room. What? Why? Can't you see, child? If they're after her for talking to you, they might be after you. Are you sure this doesn't have to do with you? Me? <laughs> Foolishness. Go now. Give me my phone back. No calls. What are you doing? Taking the SIM card. There you go. Hernan ushered Lilike into the safe room with their older sister, Betchy, who was watching dance holograms on her tablet. Elsewhere in the city, Thaddeus Sabbath turned up the volume on his holographic projector. Static grew as the volume on the projector rose, but as Lilike simultaneously reached to change the channel to the news and unmute the holovid in the safe room, playing the same projection, a startling sound emanated from it. It was the sound of their own name, coming from Wolf News anchor Wazel Baxter.
We have a disturbing development in the hostage situation at Pennsylvania Mega Hotel on 7th Avenue. Neo Amsterdam's Blackguard Enforcement Division has dispatched crack hostage negotiator Marcus C. Kurosawa, whose bionic legs with the famous stabilizing jets have allowed him to talk or whisk many a denizen off the ledge of a stratoscraper without plummeting to their death. He can't fly, as we all know from a couple near misses, but he can hover and cushion a fall. But who's at risk of falling today? Among the hostages on the 70th floor, blackguards believe terrorists have kidnapped a 10-year-old child to be used as a human shield. None other than the non-binary prodigy Lilike Pessoa, about whom Ms. Peterson has been creating a documentary expose. Now that the Digi-Cat was out of the bag, Hernan relented in allowing Lilike to hear the broadcast. It would come out one way or another. Wazel Baxter continued. Lilike, uh, of course, notorious for stirring up the stone stew that killed Victor von Drum, the Chancellor of Bohemia, is a polarizing figure. Polarizing? Lilike interjected. Or, I should say, they are a polarizing figure. Deputy Blackguard Chief Rosaria Salas joins me via Hololink to discuss the situation. What are you hearing on the ground, Chief Salas? You call me Detective. So humble, <laughs> Detective Salas. Unlike poor Lilike, if the renewed allegations are true. What allegations? Shh, no clue. Just listen. Actually, Betty, look after your sibling. I'll return with dinner. No funky business. Betty nodded in compliance. Hernan exited the room. The door clinked shut with several servo locks clicking into place. Clampy flickered into a staticky, translucent form. Awaking Wazzle Deposit. There's your Wazzle. So... Tell me about bat shards. How will they set me free? I never promised bat shards. If you see one of those, run the other way. A shard universe, on the other hand, like a shard of crystal, is a piece broken off of a larger structure. It can grow on its own under certain circumstances, and it develops independently of your current habitat. That is what would need to be cultivated if you want to break out of here. But you said I need a relationship. Like yes, a meaningful connection, like the one you're working on with the pasty pale bat fellow might allow you to break from this reality. Could this shard consist of multiple friendships with non-bats? Yes. Though your batting average for making friends is pathetically bad. I beg your pardon? So far, you... Hey, I can be friend with the best of them. Why, yes, I'm a... Yes, you are so good at making friends, others find it difficult to keep up with you. Thanks. Flattery usually does work if you have more charisma than a bat shark. See, that's a prime example of how yes, you... Yes, I see. Damn paper clamp has me dead to rights. I'm a lousy friend. Don't threat, Elder Flesh Module. Making friends gets tougher as one ages. It's even harder when you're dead. I imagine so. But if you can make a friend or two and manage to establish sovereignty over a shard world, you may be able to opt out and, as you say, get out. However, it has never been done. Even if you manage to accomplish this highly improbable feat, it is unclear how you will sustain a stable afterlife. And please note that morticide is not a sanctioned or encouraged action, but it would be yours to take should you choose to do so before countermeasures are taken. I'm sorry, what's morticide? Please insert Wazzle to continue. Oh, great. 
you're extorting me for the only thing that brings true comfort and joy. Vlath? Oh, Vlathy, we need more wazzles. Ow! Hey, stop it. See what you've created. Here. Alternate flavor required. You're kidding. I never thought anyone could make Clippy look like a saint. But you've done it. Enjoy this mauve wazzle. It's cordial flavor. Acknowledged. Now get on with it. Morticide. Morticide is when the consciousness of a dead body commits suicide. Good to know. I've been eager to escape this daymare for weeks now. Yet the more I learn, the more I intend to stay asleep here as long as I can. And if it's a friendship contest you want, then look out. You might get killed. With kindness. Alternatively, perhaps there's a detail or some other chink in the armor of my companion node that will pop up. There are always seams somewhere. And if you look closely enough, you're liable to find one. Isn't that right? Search yourself. Has this solved your issue? No. But if you would please leave me alone, that'd be dandy. As I need a little bit of shut eye. Oggly doodly doo! Golly! What an irritating paper clamp! I wouldn't put that on a masochist's nipple! You said it, Bloppy. Shocking Sleep Facts, Volume 25. In light of my upcoming sinus surgery, during which the surgeon promised he'll insert endoscopic tools into my nostril, resection it, and do his damnedest not to nick my brain or sever the important nearby nerves of my right eye and right ear, there's only a 1% chance of that, I'd like to touch on a relevant sleep fact about the medical profession itself. So let's talk about sleep and healthcare. This is drawn from Why We Sleep by Matt Walker, Chapter 15, Sleep and Society. When receiving medical care at a hospital, it would be wise to ask the doctor, how much sleep have you had in the past 24 hours? Why is that? The staggering answer after these credits. Screaming Panda presents Cyborg B, Episode 25 the 15th chapter of Hellgate City Season 2. Kevin Barry wrote, performed, and directed it and its original music and episode art, and he'll probably have returned from the Ripper Dock with an undeviated cyber septum by the time this comes out. Pray for his recovery. This chapter's bonus tale is Cybernetics, Glitch in the Waitrix 25. In a rare deviation from our usual policy, it's available for free at patreon.com forward slash Hellgate City, which you should subscribe to since it is the only place that we take in revenue at this point, and it's the best way to support the show. Have you ever been told you'd be better off with a major body modification? Whenever I face that conundrum, I like to tell the doctor, I'll do it. But I want to see you do it first. Watch them wriggle their way out of that one. And now the conclusion of Shocking Sleep Facts, Volume 25. So why is it wise to ask your doctor how much they slept last night before they operate millimeters from your brain? It's a good question because the doctor's response will determine to a statistically provable degree how likely the doctor's treatment will result in a serious medical error or even death. We all know nurses and doctors work long consecutive hours. The most punishing schedules fall upon doctors in medical school during their training years. But most of us don't know why. For that answer, join our Patreon and listen to The Uncut Sleep Fact. Till next time, Night Stroller. I wish you five soporific sleep cycles and only ask for a five-star rating on Spotify in return. Stay dreamy and stay tuned. <laughs>